Um, what I'm going to do is just uh, take a play a little bit more on what Dennis was, was talking about. And again, uh, thank you for um, in, in the invitation as well as you know, the whole Team Atlanta group trying to have a family. I, I think that they've really cultivated a tremendous uh, job of creating a family of people who really love education. So they've really done a terrific job with that. As a disclosure, we work with several different companies, companies that are here. I gave a hands-on course yesterday for uh, Biomed. So that was a lot of fun talking about the provisional restoration. All right, so, so David asked me today to follow Dennis and talk a little bit about what are some of the requirements for immediate um, implant provisional uh, restoration. So that's what we're going to be speaking about today. And I think one of the key factors is when you look at the tissue sculpting, and as Dennis said, we had quite a few in that study. The multi-center study had over 50 implants, but um, looking at our practice, we've done 126 uh, immediate anterior implants, and um, we've only had, I think, two or three failures. So the survival rates are very good, but the strategy that Dennis talked about, grafting the tissue zone as well as the bone zone, we see results like this on a consistent basis. And I think the key factor then becomes, is this going to be sustainable in regards to what we see with our peri-implant soft tissues? Because prosthetically, that's very critical for abutment selection in regards to strength and aesthetics. So that's the factors that we have to deal with. So what we're going to be discussing is really about um, a couple different things. The first is that we're going to talk about the layperson's visual perception threshold, as Dennis had talked about what actually happens. So we're going to look at what patients can actually see. What factors actually affect peri-implant soft tissue thickness? I think that's an interesting discussion. Dennis also mentioned some of those things about soft tissue adherence. We'll talk about how do we fabricate them. And again, I'll mention a couple of things about the future. So that's how we'll look at this. Let's take the first aspect, which is really about what is the perception threshold. As Dennis talked about, uh, that last group um, really had very little collapse. Again, the multi-centered uh, study that we had done. So I think the key is how much buccolingual collapse is visibly noticeable. That's really the key factor. Again, that group four only collapsed about a quarter of a millimeter. So if it's only collapsing about a quarter of a millimeter, you know, we, we see all day and people talk all the time about um, you have to over-engineer, over-engineer. And yet, again, we had collapse in those groups, but the real question becomes, what can patients actually see? Like I said to you before, these were the four uh, different groups in regards to the multi-centered study. Dennis had talked about these, and again, just a straight healing abutment, just letting that collapse, then just the provisional restoration. Group three, which is really Team Atlanta's data, with Maurice and Henry and David doing that, um, is grafting. But the difference between group one and group three is where they used a contoured healing abutment to try to contain the bone graft material. And as Dennis had mentioned, that we had most of the patients in group two and group four. With our group practice, we had the ability to make a provisional at the time that the patient received the implant and the bone graft material. Just the quick numbers, just a, a quick summary. Dennis had mentioned again that, you know, really group four, we had less than a quarter millimeter of collapse. But even in group three, we only had about a quarter millimeter. I think the take-home message with the data is that if you can contain the graft and protect it, that becomes important. And in fact, group three and group four were statistically significant between group one and group two, thanks to Hanai and Christian uh, doing all the statistics in Maryland and really working diligently and trying to find out what is uh, statistically uh, significant. This piece is really about clinical significance. So if we look back at um, a web-based study that we actually looked at the different patients, and Dennis showed you many different examples of which those patients were part of the web-based study, you can see that we had patients that had no collapse, a quarter millimeter and a half a millimeter. Actually, the first patient Dennis showed, uh, Francesca, only had about a half a millimeter of collapse. We also tried to correlate the amount of collapse with what we call delta E values and color difference which is really the visible, um, perceptible threshold in regards to tissue color changes. If it's less than four, which is basically no change up to half a millimeter, um, that seems to be the threshold level where this would be acceptable because the threshold of visual perceptibility in color differences has to be greater than four. So in fact, a zero to a half a millimeter of collapse is less than four, so it's not going to be noticeable. However, uh, greater than a millimeter. A millimeter and a millimeter and a half, you can see those delta E numbers are way above four, and this would not be acceptable because, again, you would have a, a visual uh, difference in this. So we had 
web-based study of 100 respondents. This is just, again, uh, the patient Dennis showed before with the bone graft and the provisional, only about a quarter millimeter of collapse, and we asked online whether or not patients can see a difference in the uh, soft tissue color uh, in the patient's smile. Now, this is the one patient he showed, again, half a millimeter of collapse. Uh, again, you can see that there's no visible color uh, change between the right and left central incisor. And this particular patient had a millimeter, and she actually complained that she could see actually a color difference here around the gums between the implant site and her natural contralateral tooth number nine. And then you could see here, this one particular patient had 1.5 millimeters. This becomes pretty obvious that this patient had discoloration associated with the collapse. So what does all the data actually mean? Well, if you look at the threshold, again, response of, of 100, we look at the percentage of the respondents in each of these various uh, collapse groups, again, what patients could actually see or not. You'll notice that there's a high number of, of no in groups zero to a half a millimeter, meaning that could patients see a difference in the color based upon the amount of collapse? Again, they said they could not see a difference. In fact, from zero to a half a millimeter, the number of respondents were, were greater than three quarters of the group, you know, 75 and above. So again, patients could not see the difference if we had up to a half a millimeter of collapse. However, if you look at the respondents of yes, what they could actually see, now you actually see that a millimeter or greater in this zone over here, they could actually see a difference. They could actually see a difference. In fact, um, at one millimeter, it's almost 50-50. So you actually have to be greater than a millimeter of collapse for, before it becomes visually noticeable. So you have to have greater than one millimeter of buccolingual collapse with tissue discoloration. I think that's the key before it becomes visually perceptible. So if you place the implant in correctly, you didn't put a bone graft in, you have a thin tissue type, you get collapse, that could be a warning sign. So you just have to be a little bit careful. Again, this sort of ties together what Dennis talked about in those numbers. The real question becomes, well, if we have buccolingual collapse uh, without tissue discoloration, would it be noticeable? And I have a feeling the answer would be no, because we have a lot of delayed sites uh, that we can never reconstruct fully and recon reconstitute to the opposite side, yet implants are placed and patients don't seem to notice that. Again, I think it has to be coupled with tissue discoloration. What about some other factors that would affect peri-implant soft tissue thickness? I think the bone graft and provisional that Dennis talked about, but also soft tissue adherence, which he showed, I think, quite clearly. We'll go into this a lot more in detail. Again, the peri-implant soft tissue thickness is a key factor. Uh, what is those numbers in actuality with natural tooth sites? Well, this is sort of a confusing table, but I'm just gonna sort of cut to the chase. And the bottom line is the following. If you look at natural tooth sites, and you measure it one millimeter from the free gingival margin, the average natural peri-implant soft tissue thickness is roughly one millimeter in thickness. It's one millimeter in thickness, one millimeter from the free gingival margin. That's the bottom line. That's what occurs in nature. We don't have a lot of data out there, but that's a good litmus to remember. Okay, so it's one millimeter, uh, one millimeter from the free gingival margin. Okay, that's a simple number to remember. Again, in the dual zone study that Dennis had talked about, is that we also looked at not only the contour change, but also the peri-implant soft tissue thickness. Again, we wanted to measure that, and the default implant depth was roughly three millimeters at the time of surgery from the free gingival margin that would be reflective of your normal midfacial uh, osseous crest. So again, we were able to do that. Now, if the default measurement was three millimeters in depth, you would basically have three zones, you'd have a gingival zone that was roughly a millimeter in, in height, a middle zone that would also be a millimeter in height, and consequently an incisal zone that would be also roughly a millimeter in height with, again, a three millimeter uh, implant positioning in depth. We could then take calipers and then measure each one of these zones. So with the peri-implant soft tissue, we had three points of reference. Dennis had mentioned with the contour change, we had seven points of reference. A lot of the papers don't really have a lot of points of reference. You can ask Kanai, she had waded through all this Excel spreadsheet with so much information, it's just overwhelming. But we wanted to uh, be in, into the details. And then we can measure this again. The results um, are pretty straightforward. In group one, you could see that 
if the critical number is two millimeters of peri-implant soft tissue thickness, you basically need um, uh, two millimeters uh, to block out, say, a gray abutment. So the only area where you have that, if you let the tissue completely collapse, is at the gingival area, not a place where you probably want your, uh, your uh, restorative interface to be if it's a cement-retained crown. Uh, group two is where we did the provisional, obviously the provisional helped in the, the peri-implant soft tissue thickness because the secondary discussion would be whether or not we had adherence to that provisional, as Dennis had mentioned. Uh, group three, where Maurice and Henry and David and, and Ronnie had all this data, um, basically the bone graft and the contoured healing abutment did uh, pretty much the same as the provisional restoration, but group four uh, did actually the best. So in group four, where we had a contoured um, provisional restoration that contained the graft uh, more in a customized way, we really had um, a greater soft tissue thickness. So group four seemed to do the best. Again, Hanai is going to do the statistics on that group. And we found that the, most of the change was at the gingival or middle zones, again, above the two millimeter mark, which is critical, as we all know. And the amount of change that we could gain in the gingival and middle zones roughly is half to one millimeter in increasing the soft tissue thickness. Again, the strategy behind this is that no uh, connective tissue grafting was done. Um, in the data set, we only looked at the importance or the relevance of a provisional, a contoured uh, healing abutment, uh, and bone grafting. That was really the concepts that we were looking at. So again, you could gain and thicken your peri-implant soft tissue by how much? Half to one millimeter without doing a connective tissue graft. I think that's very important to understand that. So you can see group one, you can see thinning of the peri-implant soft tissue accompanied with the buccolingual collapse. So if we just let it collapse and do nothing, but group four, again, that one patient, Marcy, that Dennis showed, uh, you can clearly see that's really nice tissue. And then you have everything in the world to choose whatever material you'd like and locate your margin in any position you'd like because you have robust tissue. Again, in group four, we could thicken that peri-implant soft tissue thickness above the two millimeter mark at the middle and gingival zones uh, with the bone graft only and again without connective tissue grafting. Because we always get that question, you know, what do you do with the other part? Now Maurice is uh, looking at what's the relevance of connective tissue grafting with Andrea and Alessandro. So that'd be interesting to combine all that data. What we're trying to do is just delineate different ones. If I could look at um, an old case that Dennis had actually given me, I don't know how old this case is, Dennis, but in the old days, before guided bone regeneration, you could place a bone graft into a socket, and here he was placing a connective tissue graft just sort of as a barrier. Again, these are scanned slides, so you, you know how old these cases are. But what was very relevant when I saw these slides that he showed me was that you could see the bone graft material got incorporated into the soft tissue flap. It didn't act as an irritant. It was just embedded in the soft tissue flap. He didn't get complete GBR. He was able to get the implant in, but look at the bone graft material in the soft tissue flap. That flap is now thickened. So if we go back to what we're doing presently with the grafting, and again, grafting the tissue zone, not just the bone zone, you can get an appreciation why our numbers are now greater if you look back at some older cases. How does this relate to some recent data? Well, Joe Kahn actually looked at bone grafting, only the bone zone, but putting a connective tissue graft in the tissue zone. Again, Dennis is saying graft the bone zone and the tissue zone. Joe Kahn only grafted the bone zone with bone graft material, but did a connective tissue graft in the tissue zone, okay? Uh, we don't know what would happen if Joe Kahn had actually bone grafted the, the tissue zone. But the bottom line is the following. He looked at two groups where he did uh, no connective tissue grafting, and he measured the peri-implant soft tissue thickness at the time, and um, up to, I think, six or 10 months later. And then he looked at the connective tissue grafting, and these are the numbers. So the bottom line in his study was that, well, if he did a connective tissue graft in the, in the tissue zone, how much was he able to gain? A millimeter. What did I say with the bone grafting? We gained half to one millimeter without connective tissue grafting. So those numbers are very similar. If I go back now and compare what Joe Kahn did with our data set, JK is Joe Kahn, and group four was our best group. Again, measuring at the two millimeter mark, um, Joe only measured two millimeters from the free gingival margin. So I'm gonna take his data at that point. Remember, if you do nothing, his number said it was 1.5. Our data said if you do nothing, it was 1.8, pretty similar. So like Dennis said, there's a lot of data now that are sort of saying the same thing. So it's very promising. 
If Joe did a connective tissue graft only in the tissue zone, he thickened it to 2.6. With the bone graft, we thickened it to 2.4. That pretty much says it all. So do you necessarily need to do that? I'm not so sure. So the bone graft, as you know, is really terrific. That works well, but the provisional is also equally important. I had a discussion with Dennis and Christian Steppert on a plane one time, and Christian goes, no, Steve, it's all about the bone graft. It's all about the bone graft. Well, let me share you this example. You know, you learn from when you look, look back at cases. Well, if the strategy here is if it's all about the bone graft, so it doesn't matter what I put in as a provisional or transitional restoration, you could see here the contour at the time of surgery. But the problem here is we have no prosthetic containment of that bone graft material. So without prosthetic containment, maybe you can get away with this on a really thick phenotype patient, a patient who has a premaxilla the size of a rhinoceros, you're fine. But if the t patient has thin tissue, and I think I misdiagnosed this case in this situation, you could clearly see here if you cannot contain it and protect it and maintain it, you have a pretty good chance of losing it. So I think the prosthesis has something to do with that. So what about soft tissue adherence, as Dennis had talked about? Well, we know that when we remove healing abutments, we could see bleeding. Sometimes you see bleeding, like he said to you before. I, people see this phenomenon, and sometimes we see uh, abutments, and we remove them, and we don't see bleeding. So we have clinical scenarios that look like this. We know from Abramson's work that he basically talks about having a tissue adherence at a more coronal position. So I think Dennis made that point very clear, but if you have healing at a more coronal position, does that mean you'll have less recession and collapse? And, and we believe that's true. Because in fact, what is your provisional restoration? I call my provisional restoration a fancy healing abutment. The only difference with this is that it looks like a tooth and it's tooth colored. That's the only difference, but in fact, this is a healing abutment. So if we think about what Abrahamson did, and we can then combine that with our provisional restoration groups, and look at disconnection as such as this, this is what you should see upon first disconnection. Upon provisional restoration disconnection, you should see bleeding, which would allude to tissue adherence. Now, it's not what we're doing with, like Ronnie Nevins is doing with histology. I can't tell you what the histology shows, but there clearly is bleeding, and if you know from what Dennis talks about, epithelium has no blood supply, so you've obviously severed something that would cause the connective tissue to be exposed because the tissue underneath that has the vascularity. And we really saw that we had some better situations like this. Here's an example. No adherence, no bleeding, collapse and thinning of your peri-implant soft tissue. If you had adherence and bleeding, you see beautiful, robust tissue. It's just that simple. It is just that simple. It's looking back at what some other people did. Again, if we looked at the group then, and the difference between having bleeding or non-bleeding in group four, well, if we didn't have bleeding, even with the bone graft, we lost tissue. We lost tissue thickness in each of those zones. How much did we lose? About a half a millimeter more collapse if we didn't have adherence, even with the bone graft. So the bottom line, the bone graft is really your insurance policy in case you don't have adherence. Well, how can we get predictable adherence? Well, number one, it has to be clean. And number two, I think you have to have enough vertical soft tissue thickness. The vertical soft tissue thickness is something I learned from Maurice, and I'll explain that afterwards. But both have to be in concert to be working together. First of all, what we do before we put the provisional in the patient's mouth is that we clean, I steam clean the heck out of that uh, provisional restoration, the connection, and the part that's going to touch the soft tissue profile. Now, you can look over here. The second part is vertical soft tissue thickness. Well, here I have a two millimeter healing, um, I'm sorry, a three millimeter healing abutment, so you know that the soft tissue is less than three millimeters. So we have less than three millimeters of, of, of soft tissue height, so vertical soft tissue thickness. Again, you could see that there's a little plaque on the abutment. We'll, we'll talk about that. And when we remove it completely, there's no bleeding. There's no bleeding, there's no adherence. So again, we have thin peri-implant soft tissue height in this situation. But here's an abutment that's a five millimeter healing abutment. And again, when we remove it, you could see there is some plaque at the coronal aspect. But again, when you see this, you see definitely bleeding. So I think soft tissue height is, is in concert with a clean surface. If you don't have enough soft tissue height, I think it's impossible to get adherence because we have something called plaque. Because plaque, as we know from the periodontal literature, tissue could not 
adhere to plaque at all. So plaque becomes a factor. Here again is a three millimeter tall healing abutment. It's pretty much contained all the way to the soft tissue height, as you see here, and there's not a lot of exposure to it. But here I'm going to unscrew that um, healing abutment for the first time, and what we're actually doing is not taking bleeding indexes or plaque indexes, we're actually taking the actual abutment out. We can then use disclosing solution, the erythrocin stain, and we can actually then measure that. I've also uh, was kind enough to get um, this ruler from Christian Coachman from his uh, digital smile design, and I've been able to use that. And if we take good photographs of our images, we'll then able to then recalibrate the digital caliper. Again, I learned that from Christian Coachman. And then you could see here that now I have my ruler that's exactly calibrated, and now I can take any of the abutments that have predetermined markings on them from the manufacturer. We can then disclose the abutment and then we can actually measure the zone of where plaque is adhering because plaque is adhering to say one and a half to two millimeters of that abutment. We know we can never get adherence onto that surface. Again, um, I'm gonna commandeer Hanai and put her on the spot to help us with this data set as well. We've looked at about 50 abutments so far and the mean average about what plaque actually occupies is about one to two millimeters. So we know that you can never get adherence. So the story then becomes, well, if I don't have enough vertical soft tissue height, I can never get adherence because plaque is occupying some of that vertical soft tissue height. You understand what I'm saying? It's a little bit of an esoteric conversation. And again, um, from Maurice, Maurice had turned me on to Thomas Linkovis's work and looking at soft tissue height as it relates to the back door, which is implant depth. You know, implant depth is the same as vertical soft tissue height. And it was very interesting what Thomas actually did he looked um, at two millimeters or less in thickness. He looked at between two and three millimeters and greater than three millimeters in thickness. What was alarming is that if you have two millimeters or less um, of soft tissue height, you could lose up to a millimeter and a half of bone. Let me say that again. If you have two millimeters of soft tissue height, you potentially will lose on average 1.5 millimeters of bone. And if you had greater than three millimeters of soft tissue thickness, you basically lost nothing. So it has to relate back to that discussion about plaque. Here's another example from another doctor who's also talking about the implants of soft tissue thickness on peri-implant bone stability and remodeling. Notice the abutment on the left is a taller abutment, indicative at the time of when this abutment was placed that the tissue was thicker. The one on the right is a shorter abutment because the tissue was thinner. But look after a longitudinal time where the bone ends up irrespective of the platform. It still remodels back to where it was. Again, what Lincoln has said, if you have thin tissue, you will lose roughly 1.5 millimeters of bone. What we should not do, what we should not do is not be respective of that and then potentially have the macro structure of the implant head and the microsurface texture, which is rough, that could be another source for plaque accumulation. I think the strategy has now changed in that when we're thinking about tissue and stability, we have to think about not where the bone is, but where the soft tissue is. In fact, you may have to rethink of where you're placing your implants relative to the soft tissue crest, not the bone crest. Just food for thought. So in fact, when we're placing some of our immediates that look so great, we're probably placing them by default a little deeper. And the reason is to get primary stability. Now, I'm not talking about driving that implant six millimeters deeper. I'm only saying or suggesting that you drive that implant a half a millimeter up to no more than one millimeter deeper than you usually would. If the average midfacial crest is three, put it at three and a half, no more than four. And that half a millimeter difference can be the, myth, the difference between success and failure, again, based upon a lot of this work. We have to accommodate for the plaque zone. Potentially, soft tissue adherence, as I showed you, was a key factor. And again, the connection is something that I think all researchers are doing. I'd like to propose a concept called the implant gingival complex. John Coyce talks about the dendro gingival complex. I think we have to put all these numbers uh, together. Well, how do we fabricate our restorations? Well, you know, whenever I, uh, Dennis does an immediate, he always comes over to me, goes, hey, Steve, don't mess up my surgery. Now, I don't know if he's kidding or not when he says that to me, but he goes, hey, Steve, don't mess up my surgery. I said, Dennis, I understand that because I understand the importance of prosthetics of how it can really preserve the tissue. But just as a counterpoint, we'd also like to have good surgery. 
because it makes her life a lot easier as well. So he clearly showed proper implant positioning. I think that is so critical. It makes the prosthetic life much easier. But I think I did misquote my partner. You know, he has all these terms. He says, you know, one miracle time, no buckle plate, no implant. But I'm going to add a third one, Dennis. And, and, but I think I accidentally misquoted you because I just heard you say this. I don't think I got it right. You know, he says, you know, the provisional restoration is not some piece of junk. But I think he were, le used the term, it's not piece, some piece of garbage. So I actually have to change the slide. But I think that I have to change it from the garbage from junk. But I think I got it sort of right. But he's correct. You have to take a lot of time because that tissue will conform to whatever you give it. Again, it has to be a supportive contour. That contour has to really support the subgingival profile. And on Thursday, when we did the hands-on, we really focused on that. So if I go back to that one patient, Marcy, the bottom line is that the quick way from what I learned from David Garber as my teacher at Penn is that you paint in an acrylic shell. You can then remount the shell all the way up to the incisal the ledge position. And then you can seat it once you have your straight abutment on. I like doing screw retain. It only offers really one subgingival inter interface, and we don't have all the problems with cement. We can then load our shell that we've reamed out and then position it accordingly. Again, what we try to do is we try to mark the contact areas. We put it on a lab analog, and we can then mark our contact areas because we're going to use that information to help position this later on. And then we can just use the acrylic and just fill it up. So it's sort of a quick simple way to do it. All manufacturers have a defined finish line where you're supposed to end the acrylic. Some people the other day didn't understand that in the hands-on, but it's important to, to actually master that part. And then you can take your burrs and you can just trim it. I always go in the lingual first. My contact areas tell me how far I can trim the lingual. It just has to be out of occlusion. And then I can just go around with the different burrs and just trim it up accordingly. If I have any voids, I can always go back and add. It's not really a big deal. Again, it has to be supportive contour. Then it showed you this, graft the tissue zone with the bone. That's the important take home message. And again, the role of the provisional restoration is really the following. It acts to help stabilize the bone graft material, but it also acts as a prosthetic socket seal. I learned this from Paul Weigel from Germany, because I think it's very important that you contain the graft material and protect it and maintain it during its healing cycle. So it's a twofold sword. The, the bone is very important, but the prosthesis is equally important. Again, Dennis showed you this, just cleaning it off. Again, you could see how the contour is now pushed out with the provisional with the bone graft in place. And again, you could have a really good time in just construction of your final restoration. It makes life easy. You can make a metal ceramic restoration, and then you can get results consistently that look like this. Well, what does the future really hold? I think the future is very interesting. Dennis talked about clearly the bone graft. I think that's very, very important. And does the size of the gap matter relative to the type of bone graft material used? Meaning does a larger gap actually shrink more than a smaller gap? And again, he talked about platform switching and Ron Nevin's work on textured abutments I think is very relevant. If we look at platform switching, here's just a quick example of where um, these um, uh, restorations were done as a one abutment, one time protocol as Henry has advocated using a uh, Densply's implant system. But here we're using a Biomet implant that I had to make a provisional, and I removed that four times. In fact, you could see with this double platform switch that has been reported in the dental literature that you see no bone loss whatsoever, even after four disconnections. And in fact, the inter-implant distance here is less than three, and this is less than two. So you could clearly see that platform switching, if all the ingredients are right, will allow this to occur quite nicely. But I think the remaining question uh, remains is that if we, are we actually increasing the peri-implant soft tissue thickness without contour change? Or are we sacrificing contour change at the expense of having greater peri-implant soft tissue thickness? I really don't know that answer. I think that's for future research. And again, with Ron Nevin's work, the bottom line, having a textured buttment, well, would it be advantageous in thin uh, tissue type cases? I think I made that point very clear, that if you have thin tissue, but now if you had a textured abutment, would that be advantageous in especially thin tissue type cases? And if that's exposed to the oral environment, would it be more plaque attractive? So these are some of the things to think about. And from a prosthetic end, we understand, uh, Pat Allen talked about this quite clearly, is the following. If we have a laser lock abutment and we can encourage a different quality of tissue adherence,
And more importantly, we could do a digital type of um, restoration and truly do a one abutment one time with this laser lock abutment. Would that attachment to that abutment surface actually block the excess extrusion of cement and then we wouldn't have all the problems with periimplantitis. So clearly, the future is very bright of what we have in dentistry. So again, these are just some of the ideas and some of the research projects that Dennis and I are working on in regards to this. So again, the ability to maybe block apical migration of cement during cementation with the true connective tissue attachment is something I think is very promising from a prosthetic standpoint. So in conclusion, the take home message is the following. Clearly, the provisional restoration with the bone graft really works quite well without a connective tissue graft. It's important that the provisional actually supports the subgingival contour. The concept of a prosthetic seal is very important, and cleaning the provisional is also very important before insertion, but you also have to have enough implant depth or proper vertical soft tissue height. I think that's very important. Special thanks is really to the following. I'm calling it Mr. Eddie Salama because um, Eddie is really sort of the unsung hero uh, behind organizing and really working hard with Dental XP. I, I know all the partners at Team Atlanta are smiling now because without Eddie really being uh, the driving force, I mean, he's done such a terrific job. So I'm going to call him Mr. Eddie Salama. So if you happen to see Eddie, please call him Mr. Eddie Salama. Team Atlanta, of course, I was working together just to honor and privilege to work with my old teacher, uh, David Garber, for all these years. And Hanai, of course, and Christian, who have really been very helpful in the whole process. Again, thank you. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. I hope to get back to New York in one piece with the snowstorm. But it's always an honor and privilege and people who are so dedicated to education. Again, Ronnie, thank you for having a vision in um, this whole educational piece and being a leader again in, in dentistry. Thank you very much for your time.